What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Puzzle Huddle with Experts. I have a fantastic guest, Dr. Tucker Oluwale. Uh, she has a PhD in hospitality management. She's, she's a high achieving professional, so we're really uh, excited to have her here and to learn about her background and both her professional experience. Uh, so Dr. Oluwale, th th thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much, Matthew. Love everything that you're doing with Puzzle Huddle. Oh, well, th th thank you for that. Just as a point of intersection, just to set the foundation for us, can you explain to us what your what your academically what your academic background is and what you're what you're an expert in? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so my academic background is actually in a business. Mm -hmm. uh, undergrads from Florida A and M University, SBI. Okay, okay, uh, okay. the Rattlers on there. HBCU, uh, and my uh, master's is in sports management, so I actually worked in sports first, uh, worked for an agent, and then I went into uh, two internships, one with a basketball team and one with, uh, with uh, golf, and golf is what really brought me into a much larger space of hospitality, and then I have an MBA uh, from uh, Winthrop University, and my PhD is in hospitality administration from Oklahoma State University. So you degreed up. That, that's okay. <laughs> It's, it's one way of saying it. <laughs> Very impressively. Uh, and then for, for, your, for your dissertation, what is it that you studied for, for the actual dissertation part of your, your doctoral degree? Sure, absolutely. Um, my dissertation uh, was in emotional regulation uh, strategies. So basically training or how can we train uh, service employees uh, in emotional regulation uh, strategies in order to deal with negative guests. Um, and so it was really kind of built off of these concepts called emotional labor, uh, these theories um, also called there's actually something called role theory um, that is actually used where employees adjust themselves when they are dealing and working um, with the public. Um, and uh, so I pretty much examined a, a wide range of, of employees in service industries and uh, actually created an experimental design where I sort of took one group and actually taught them these strategies and then uh, recalibrated and, and surveyed them again to see if there was uh, if there was a difference. That's, that's tough work because front, frontline employees, you guys, when, where there are unhappy customers, uh, they, they have to they have to take in that feedback and whether the problem was something they created or it's handed down by management or or just a natural event that just broke the thing. Um, it, you know, there could be a flood and that's why that's why everything is broken. Uh, but dealing with those frontline service workers that have to deal with customers. Wow. That can be rough. Um, you're dealing yeah, with it was a really interesting. The findings were really interesting. Um, that most, you know, many of the employees expect that there's going to be a percentage of negative guests. Like, so that wasn't, it wasn't so much statistical significance there. It was how it was handled is where we saw the difference. So how did management really handle it? Did they actually solve the problem? or did they kind of put it back on them? And, and they were really looking for, how can my employee really help me in, uh, in, in kind of you know, regulating and giving, giving me these spaces in order to be able to recalibrate? And uh, that's where we found this, this significance in. Wow, and, and you're, you're triggering my, my thinking about some things I've seen online. In, in fast food, there's even a risk of violence uh, when you're a frontline employee dealing with consumers and frustration. And so yeah, God, goodness. That, that, that is tough work and not necessarily compensated at a high rate uh, appropriate for, you know, you know, the thing, all the things that are involved. All right. Not th so thanks for setting the foundation for me. Now, take me back to your childhood uh, and we'll, we'll stack our way back to where you are professionally. What, 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 what kind of kid were you? Um, well, I'm originally from Chicago. Um, okay. I, um, my, both of my parents, I was a surprise kid. Uh, they said I was, a, I was a surprise. I'm eight years younger than my older brother. So uh, my parents thought they weren't going to have any more children. Grew up on the South Side, and then they bought their house and got everything together. And then here I came. So I grew up around a lot of adults, a lot of older people. I was just saying like that. Um, and so I was. I grew up, I would say, very comfortable in knowing that there was always someone around. Yeah. Uh, so it was just the two of us, but in the four, my brother and I, and then my, both of my parents, uh, but we had cousins. I lived on the South side of Chicago. So we had the cousins that lived on the South side. We had my, my great aunts, my grandmother's sisters. Um, there was all, and all of my cousins were even older than me. So I have one that's around my age, but most of them were older than me. So I always had, somebody was taking me someplace. Um, I was always kind of pulled even out of my house and, and, and shown downtown and, and, and getting in a car and, you know, driving down south to visit family or just something like that. So I had a very, very 
a warm and comfortable, I would say, loving, you know, a childhood. Uh, you know, I grew up in a black neighborhood. You know, I grew up, you know, like everyone wants to talk, you know, how bad, you know, everything is. Now I grew up in a, a black neighborhood. People were working um, and everyone knew each other. Uh, so it wasn't 8,000 years ago either. It was, it was <laughs> I, I would like to say. Can you tell me which, which high school was it that you attended in Chicago? Uh -huh. So I went to St. Ignatius. I went to St. Ignatius College Prep. So uh, I was one of those kids. I did uh, all 12 years in Catholic school, even though I'm not Catholic. Okay, because my, my undergrad uh, experience is at Howard and the pipeline for Whitney Young, oh, they, they, send, they send the students to Howard big time. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, Whit Whitney Young was actually very close to Ignatius. Uh, it wasn't that far, yeah, yeah, so I got you. All right, and then activities, extracurricular thing. I'm, I'm assuming, well, let me, let me ask. You have a, a PhD and an MBA. Were you always a good student or is that something that kind of you matured into um, as an adult? Uh, I had to really work. Uh, I, I think I'm, <laughs> I think I over, I was, I wasn't that kid that had to read something and I got it immediately. No, I had to study. I was that flashcards kid. Okay. I had to, yeah. Um, and now I think learning about it now is that now I know how I learn and I learn a lot by having to visualize it in my head first and then writing it down. Um, I didn't know that at the time. I thought I just had to like read it. And then that was it. I had to see it in my brain. And so I was that kid. So no, um, it's just that I didn't. So I never had a problem with, um, I, love, I love math, interestingly enough, and didn't really think that there was actually going to be a career in that because I think I love the element of solving the problem. Like I knew that there was like an end. Um, more than the fact that I was just a brilliant math person. I just love that hunt to, to solve the problem. And I think that's what has kind of taken me even to what I'm even doing now is the problem solving. Well, are there PhDs in your family that like, how did you get exposed to even the idea or concept of, of earning a PhD? Yeah, so as early as I can remember, uh, my mother uh, was not afforded the um, the ability to go to college. She wanted to go to college and my grandmother was just not, it was not her focus. So my mom always had to pay for it herself. So when I remember being five years old and my mom getting her bachelor's degree. I, mean, I would wake up in the middle of the night, go downstairs, oh, she was wow. to work, I'd just fall asleep on the couch. Um, and my mom, or, my mom ended up passing right before I was, uh, she got, died of cancer before I turned 15 and she was just wow. finishing up her second master's degree. So I think I was just always exposed around and, and she worked and she's married and all those things. So, you know? so, so you I think saw I was the schoolwork. You, you saw her doing homework. I saw her doing the work. Yeah. Yeah. More than it was about me being this like giftedly smart person. I just saw the grind. And, 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 and my parents never told me that I couldn't do something. That just never, it never was in there. I wanted to work in sports, okay. You know, I wanted to go to Florida a &M, you know, I wanted to go, to, uh, okay. You know, it was, there was never a, oh my gosh, why you need to do that? That was the rest of the world. Okay. Now tr tr try to help me place this hospitality, this interest in hospitality and sports in your childhood. Like, yeah. is, is that present at all in what you were doing as a kid? Yeah, as a, well, as a kid, I um, I started like running track when I was in the fourth grade. So I actually ran track from like fourth to eighth grade. Okay. Um, I got to high school. Um, and ran track only one year, my freshman year, because, you know, once you get to high school, regardless of what it is, people get serious, you know, <laughs> they want to get scholarships and things like that. Yeah. So I fell off from, from running track, um, but I, and I moved into like uh, the acting, the, the theater. I love that. Oh, I was wow. student government. Um, I was the one that started like the, um, I did like one of the first, uh, myself and actually this Jewish kid. Uh, in a Catholic school, we actually did the first like international festival. So planning things, I was the, I became like vice president of junior class just because I wanted to plan junior prom. Yeah. I was that like that person, but I would use it. I'd, I'd backdoor my way uh, into uh, realizing, oh my goodness, if you're part of these organizations, these are the ones that actually make it happen. So I was that kid. So, but so I, so exercise education was always something that was part. Um, my parents always had me in like a, a tennis class or a golf class mm -hmm. or something mm -hmm. like that. So I had that. And so, but even though that I knew that wasn't going to be my career as an athlete, I definitely uh, understood uh, the, the understanding of keep taking care of yourself. All right. Take, take, take me to FAMU now. What, what were some yeah. of your favorite experiences about while you were attending FAMU? Oh, fan you was the best, best, know, best four uh, years. I know, um, I know. You know, I think uh, with hitting fan you, well, there's a lot of Chicago people <laughs> that go to fan you. Uh, that's, that's another pipeline. Um, I think going, they're going south. Uh, experiencing, this, it was hot in Chicago, but Florida hot is different. Um, experiencing nothing but black professors. 
um, experiencing, a, 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 oh my gosh, a, a Luther Campbell, Luke, like that, like Luke was, was the big thing. Oh. I come okay. from house music. Yeah, I was down there. I, I know the time period. Yeah. You I know, know the time period, right? Uh -huh, so, move something. Um, yep. Yeah. Bass, you know, like that. You know, all those type. It was, it was phenomenal. I remember the first week I was like, oh my gosh, how am I going to dance to this? By Friday, I was like. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Because so Chicago is a dancing culture too. So you just got to figure out how to move your body differently, but yeah. you, you'll get it. Yeah. And um, and really, I mean, I was I was in the school of business. I was a, a business major. Uh, the dean at the time, uh, rest in peace, uh, Sybil Mobley, had a vision of what she wanted uh, black sh kids to really black students to achieve in corporate America. And she had this vision of doing things like four years of professional development. I had to take while there. For, uh, we had to take a business sport. People used to laugh at us. Um, and so the business sports at the time were, uh, we had to pick between golf, tennis, or racquetball. And so I picked golf, uh, which led into kind of a, a real interesting experience. And so just being like exposed and being placed into a very safe, sitting and actually talking to CEOs. Like okay. she said, these black kids can do it. And you're going to come down to Tallahassee, Florida. You're not mm -hmm. going to go to the big cities. You're going to come and you're going to see it. And I, I, so many of us, I mean, thousands of us have benefited from that vision. Yeah, that, that is the, the, the wonderful benefit of HBCUs is the, the, the corporate executives coming in and that, that close interactive experience where, where you have a chance to break through in and to get, get, uh, to get space and have an opportunity to, to, to pitch yourself in uh, just that developmental experience. What, one more thing I forgot to get from your childhood and then we'll go back to, to your college education. But what, what might have been like a, what, one of your, your most cherished childhood experiences like, out of all the things, like what, what's a, a thing that you really hold on to as you know, a, a hallmark uh, childhood experience that really influenced your, your trajectory? Yeah, uh, two things. One, um, my brother is a, a older brother uh, who's eight years older than me. And uh, I think when my parents, we would get into the car at like five in the morning, you know, Thanksgiving and go down and drive that either down to Mississippi where my father was from, um, or we'd go to Philly where my grandmother was. Uh, those car trips, those road trips were just so, yeah. uh, that was the oh, yeah. time, man. It was, it, was, it was such a great um, time and experience. Um, and then also um, every holiday, my family, each, one, each person in my family, like the aunts, the cousins, uh, they would pick a house um, that we would go to. So every holiday, I'm talking about, I mean, Christmas, Thanksgiving, Fourth of July barbecues, um, uh, Easter, you know, then it turned into like New Year's Day. I mean, but I, I loved getting together as a family. We, that's, we would see that. Um, and as we've all gotten older and everyone has moved, it's, it's just, it's changed so much. But uh, that was huge, huge for, for me. It wasn't uh, necessary a, a lot of material things, but I always had the security of my family. Okay. And then along the way, I mentioned earlier that I want to maybe try to understand your, the, the part of your life that where you had to overcome um, opposition and obstacles and challenges. What, are there any particularly interesting things that you've needed to overcome as a person in your life journey to arrive at you, you know, this professional place that you are now? Oh, yeah. Communication, uh, having to communicate feelings, emotions in a way that was not uh, uh, just an emotional charge. My, uh, my mother was diagnosed with cancer uh, when I was 12 years old and uh, she battled it for three years and died right, right before I turned 15. So right before I started uh, my sophomore year of high school. And so, you know, my mom always, you know, just made sure she said, you know, keep God first. Uh, she was strong the whole time. Um, but then, so then it was my father and I, and I was always a daddy's girl. So it wasn't necessarily um, challenging, but when he uh, married, he remarried 18 months after my mom passed, that's okay. where <laughs> okay. the challenging part came in because it was a whole different, you know, my father's non-confrontational and I'm not. So it was, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I believe in putting things out there, head for, uh, you know, face, for, face forward. Um, and I just didn't know how to communicate that. So I became really withdrawn. So when I went, got down to FAMU, that was like for me my ticket to be my who who I was and, yeah. and learn different things. So it was uh, for me uh, that that space and time to do that. And I I remember graduating and coming home, and uh, I was probably home for like thirty days. I ended up going and actually lived staying with an aunt and building my career from there. And eventually we've all we you know, but it took decades. Yeah. That was the oh, that was I had to overcome that. I had to overcome that uh, you know the ability to be able to articulate and communicate. Um, how I felt properly without having to be exceptionally emotive. 
about it. Yeah, yeah, that's going to be tough for anybody. There's no way that that you re, re connect those lines and and it's just like a picnic. In most cases, no, it, it required it, it's going to be challenging. All right, now this this uh, PhD in, in your doctoral dissertation, you, you described to me what you studied. But yeah. now, but why, 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 why out of all the things to pick in the whole wide world to study, why, why was it that? Sure. So um, it was not my original topic. Uh, I remember I was with my uh, my advisor and uh, Dr. Highland Q. I like to say that a uh, Ch- uh, China man, Chinese, um, but a Chinese man who was a, was a good man, a phenomenal scholar. And you know, once you kind of break down after being around for a few years, he starts breaking down why you know he did what he did, and he kind of would talk about the Cultural Revolution and how he got put on a boat, you know, sent to you know America with nothing, and education for him was his survival tool, you know. So to hear things like that, and the reason why I say that is because when I started, when I my first my topic for my dissertation originally was going to be um, how you know the economic effects of like a sporting events on okay. second tier cities and he said you know okay cool I get it you know but you would have to kind of for a dissertation you'd have to you know go study econometrics and you know economic theory and he's like that's all fine and dandy he's like but just go and talk to them first before you decide to go down this road he says but let me ask you something he's like you come from training you come from teaching you come from you do come from sports but you were actually had this company that was training employees um why don't you do your dissertation (laughs) (laughs) Like very practical, right, guy, right? The yeah, scholar, yeah. This, you know. Oh, he says, "Why don't you do something like that?" And so I said, "Okay." And so I started to 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 really do the research on how can I, you know, I, behavior is something that can be shaped and driven. We're in a hospitality is a horrible, horrible field that feels like you have to be. Most people kind of say you have to be born to be into work in this industry. You have to have hospitality in your blood. No, you don't. Uh, you if you enjoy what it is the industry. You have to still conduct training um, Mm -hmm. in areas such as consistency, behavior, knowledge. So you have a strong workforce. And there are some companies that really do it well, and most don't. And so I said, I found, you know, these economic theories, one called emotional labor and one called uh, another one role theory, and uh, saw that it was actually applied in a lot of cases. Um, Technically, police officers used to be used to be trained in emotional regulation because you have to prepare yourself before you go into a one-on-one situation with people. Teachers in certain school districts used to be trained mm-hmm. in, you know, it, uh, and making sure that they're regulating themselves before talking to parents, especially about sensitive issues, behavior, things like that. All of that's just stopped, you know, all of those, you know, avenues. And so it was just like, why well, I just, and it raised my curiosity. All right, now hospitality, in terms of people's first thinking, they, they largely think about, uh, you know, hotel, casino, restaurant. Um, but I've heard, I heard a talk where you were, you were describing the, the economic impl- imp- impact of, a, a, of shows uh, and performance. Uh, what, what are some of the, the different areas of hospitality that aren't as obvious or intuitive that are, you know, uh, a very, very meaningful uh, parts of the economy? Great question. Um, the tools of, I mean, hospitality literally sinks into every single avenue of our lives. The biggest challenge in the United States is that we're one of the very few, uh, we're probably the only G8 country that does not have a a national tourism board or a minister of tourism. So it's not articulated to us that it's actually an economic driver of the economy. So we don't learn it that way. We learn uh, tourism from magazines and and shows and things such as that, but that that there's a whole structure that's built in uh, built into it. So for me, you know, coming into it, I saw that kind of immediately. One, hospitality as a term is actually the welcoming of the stranger, right? It's actually a human interaction. It's an yeah, experience. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's not a job. <laughs> um, and so we've been, you know, and, and hospitality is shown in so many different ways. And when I sit down with ministers and priests, though, you know, hospitality is referenced 26 times in the Bible. Um, it's about that with the washing of the feet, the, you know, that's, it, it's a human to yeah. human element. That's not a job. The job part is what's called tourism sectors. And so a lot of times, you know, when I came into, into sports, specifically um, into golf and sports, the, 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 the corporate sponsors and the media are the ones that are the, they're, they're the ones that pay for everything. 
So if you you kind of shape everything around 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 that sector, but so then it's kind of like, well, what jobs go into that? Well, you got to understand, you know, uh, not just marketing as in what you see, but what's the return on an investment? Oh, there's a job for that. Oh, um, I worked at um at a, as the uh, promotions manager at, at Dave and Buster's, um, which in Jillian's Entertainment then became Dave and Buster's. Oh, okay, well that means you know how to cook or you were a server. Never was. Um, I was I understood how to bring in group events and go out and actually get groups to come and book with us uh, for for different either life moments or corporations. I knew how to talk to corporations. Oh, you know what you need? Like a summertime outing, right? Um, yeah. Let us kind of hand, handle that and you don't have to be embarrassed in front of the boss. Like I knew how to kind of talk that way. That's a job. Yeah. Um, and so, and, and, um, and uh, you can go work at, in government, right? Um, economic impact in government. One of my friends, I just had lunch with her. She came from traditional hotel operations, but she's, she works for booking.com. I mean, in customer service, like it's so yeah. many, the whole interaction with the customer and things such as that, and everybody's the Amazon now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it, because it's big. about that. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's because their skills are so transfer uh, uh, transferable. So that's where, you know, kind of we are right now. I mean, Airbnb, um, you know, you know, you know, you know, VRBO, um, how do you take events and, and drive uh, revenue to a city? That's a job. How do you work with small businesses? That's what I do now, I'm working with small businesses where I saw a problem, you know, small businesses were not getting the resources from government, from, you know, corporations, we were not working together. We need to create a platform for that. So I do that, you know, as well. So that's a job, you know? Yeah. So it's not just the person that you see, you know, you know, you know, on your, on your daily, it's, it's all the pieces behind that, 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 that make it work. Yeah. Out of, out, out of all the different things, you have not mentioned this to me as an expertise, but I, but I just kind of believe, you know, the answer where out of all the hospitality and tourism categories, where, where do black owned businesses thrive and where, where are we missing? Um, in any particular column of this industry? Sure, um, so very quickly, uh, most, actually the largest amount of black owned businesses, especially within the DMV are actually in healthcare. Uh, and somebody- No that's, way. That's the first chunk. Um, and I'm moving into hospitality, which I, in tourism, I will say that though, you know, there's a definitely a correlation between um, healthcare and, uh, and uh, in hospitality and treatment, um, especially as it relates to healing. Uh, wellness, food as medicine, um, you know, that's, mm -hmm. it's all, it's a big thing. So, uh, but, um, but and in this, but in the space of when it comes to, uh, to African-American businesses, the biggest gap is probably in the real estate part, which is, uh, which is owning like hotels, owning the buildings of the restaurants, uh, restaurants we have yeah. more ownership in because it, the, the barriers to entry are, are, are much lower, but it's also the area where you have to be so cash heavy. Um, up front and know how to really manage your debt and manage your fixed costs because you can go under so quickly. I mean, you can be six figures, you can be half a million dollars in a hole before you open. So how do you make that up, right? Um, and so that's 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 where that avenue is. And so that there, then it goes into the whole, you know, um, a financial literacy or the lack thereof, you know, financial literacy wise. So, um, but I think that, before you got to take a step back from financial literacy and an understanding, there's just a lot of stuff we don't know. Yeah. Um, so I always give businesses, people who want to open up a business, which now we're just catching this, catching people now before they sign that lease. There's yeah. three ways we tell them, hey, you know, this is what you should think about before you sign that lease. All right. And take, take, take me back to the, the um, customer service uh, <laughs> research uh, because as a small business owner um, without a lot of employees you know, I, I am the customer service facing uh, agent for my for my business a lot of times uh, and, and, and I, I absolutely love my customers it's, it's wonderful to have customers I appreciate to the support their business I appreciate every email like thank goodness somebody knew about my business to email me about something but sometimes when I'm tired and it's late at night answering email my brain is not functioning in a great way to answer email with the with the with the spirit that I want to answer it in, what what do you what do you recommend for that that kind of emotional work to help customer service people have the right frame of mind to to respond and 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 be present and be positive as they're as they're interacting with the customers? 
Absolutely. And make sure I answer your question. Taking it back. Um, so a lot of business owners, especially in the restaurant space, and we're criticized, uh, black owned businesses are heavily criticized yeah. um, about this and that we lack customer service. Well, a lot of us enter into entrepreneurship uh, all based off of something that we're very good at sort of doing, or we have something in, in the restaurant industries. I'm a great cook. Therefore, because I'm a good cook or somebody likes something that they you know, like, I therefore I'm going to open up a restaurant um, without kind of the understanding there's so many pieces in opening up a business. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the service element, not that it's not that it's not good service. It's just that you just pulled in so many different directions right. that the that that interaction goes down. And so therefore, it's like, well, we need more you know, resources so we can have more people. Well, the first thing is, is that um, in order to keep that customer service, because I'm a solopreneur uh, in many aspects as well, uh, you need to get good sleep. You need to yeah. uh, find mm -hmm. something. And I, this this is very good, good sleep. You need to find some level of an outlet. I don't care if it's walking, meditation, prayer, at least every day. I don't care when you do it. Uh, that and then go into the understanding that I'm right now behind on where I would like to be on a project because I'm actually trying to find somebody to actually do this piece for us. Mm -hmm. And I said to my partners, you, we're going to take a, 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 a smaller cut um, in our own pockets, but the impact is going to pay off much larger later we got to pay somebody to do this. A lot of times we don't even delegate or trust or pay. Um, and I believe in paying somebody a little bit of anything. So even when I have, I have a young person who's going to be doing, because we don't have a TikTok account, uh, TikTok. Um, and so she's like, oh, no, just do, I'll do it for free. But in my mind, I'm going, you know what? I'm going to give her a little, a little something because I do think that there's an element of that in, in the respect, but I got to let that go. Like, why do I need to learn how to do something when there's somebody else that can do it for me? So I, yeah. I'm slowing down on that to do that, but that helps in my customer service uh, and my service because I know that I need to be very much at, you know, 200% in, in working with our, our sponsors and partners and owners. Yeah, so you, you mentioned something that I want to go back to. This reputation for black owned businesses as being mm -hmm. a lagging in customer service. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know that it's deserved or not, uh, but it's often repeated. Uh, and it, and it's, it's kind of just, it's got a punchline to it that's got some humor. So people often repeat it because it, 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 they can get a, a laugh out of it. I, I don't know. I think a lot of the perception is actually a challenge. It's a small business challenge. It's not about them being black owned. That is the problem. It's that they don't have a lot of people. Uh, and that's, that is what is causing that outcome. But what, what do you think about that? Do, uh, do you observe like a, a deserving reputation of a particular category of businesses as being um, lacking in customer service, or, or is there something else going on? No, I think you're absolutely right. Um, it is a small business, uh, a, a challenge. It is not, uh, it has nothing to do with race. Um, I think that it's a perception that has been put on by our, sometimes by ourselves. Um, and that has to really stop. We, I, I've seen multi-million dollar startup companies that are in the beta phase that releases products and they don't work. And nobody says, you know, hey, you know what, I'm not going to go back in and do that or oh my gosh that's a that's a challenge no but when it comes down sometimes that's and i think it's a projection that we have on ourselves that really needs to stop and the data needs to be pulled um the reality is that and i was in a conversation about this the reality is that black people actually black owners hire black people black executives actually mentor black people yeah, um, i was in a conversation about black theater the other day you know black people need to support black theater and i'm like what says that they don't I'm like, uh, there is no Tyler Perry without yeah. Black theater. There's no, yeah. like, like there, every, we've always done that. I said, the difference is that there's no more Black, there's no more theaters in Black neighborhoods. I grew up on the South Side of Chicago where we had the Regal Theater, where we would go to and see, I mean, I saw Avery Brooks in a one-man mm -hmm. performance of Paul Robeson in the South Side of Chicago. I didn't have to go downtown. That doesn't exist anymore. So, and that's, and that's a, th a threat to many uh, avenues. So the reality isn't the fact there's not, there's not lack enough, we just have to travel to. And so yeah. therefore it takes other resources for that. So it's a definitely a perception of customer service. Oh my gosh, my lines are long. I've been to plenty, like there's some places in which um, other cultures, which is like, oh, I can't go there unless there is a line. Cause then at least I know it's good. Yeah. But for others, <laughs> you know, they don't always think about it like that. So we have to, we have to really kind of, stop that and really kind of get ourselves re-educated. And that's why uh, DMV Black Restaurant Week with my co-partners, that's why we do what we do, you know, throughout the year is because of that. No, perfect uh, transition point. Tell me about, uh, is it Black Restaurant Week or Black 
t- 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 tell me about that program. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's a DMV Black Restaurant Week. So I'm actually uh, the president of Loot Now LLC, which is my company. Um, and we are a hospitality consultant company. I moved to Washington, D.C. in 2017. Two things I need to know when I move some places. Where do I get my hair done and where do I go to church? And so when I joined the church, uh, there's people kept saying, uh, Chef Tate, Chef Tate. And I said, oh, you know, I, you know you're a chef. And so Farrar Tate actually ran the food service at our church, but he was also, he's a native Washingtonian, third, he lives close to third generation. Um, and so uh, he talked to me about, I said, teach me the food scene, teach me the restaurants, teach me the history. Yeah. And, uh, and so we did that and we realized, oh, you know, he was training young people and getting their food handlers license. Okay, great. Let's go ahead. Let's get together. Let's do something. I'm on, you know, the education side in college. You're the, you're the training side. Let's do workforce development stuff together. Then I read an article about this other woman, Andre A.J. Johnson, and she was she's kind of in the black spirits uh, mixology beverage world. Okay. I said I got to meet her, and so we met her, and she had a love for training, but on but in the beverage world, because if you think that we have a challenge in ownership in in restaurants and hotels, you can't. That's a whole different podcast about, about the lack of in, a, in the beverage and spirits world. So um, we came together and we said, let's do workforce development. And so we, that's when we started. And then in 2018, there was an incident that happened at a Starbucks in, in, in Philadelphia where two African-American gentlemen yeah. uh, were called on, the police were called on. And it struck me because I lived down the street from that Starbucks. And I didn't understand how it amplified. I've been to that Starbucks so many times. How did it amplify to this? Um, that also during that time, there was a series of memes of uh, Barbecue Betty, Coupon Charlie. Uh, and it was like this treatment of African-Americans in these spaces, public spaces and then restaurants. And then lastly, I, saw, I read an article in Washington Post that said, we're the black chefs and we're the black owners. And I just, I was done. I was mad. I was like, <laughs> what do you mean, where are they? They're everywhere. Yeah, uh, exactly. There wasn't a platform. And so I started seeing these, uh, these black restaurant weeks. They were all kind of around the country. There were different people that were doing it. I said, is there one for DC? And they were like, no, but let's do one for the DMV because that's really kind of the, the, the economic development engine is regional. So I said, okay, so let's do the DMV Black Restaurant Week. And that was 2018. We started with 35. We've learned a lot. Uh, we started with 35 partners. Second year, we had 42. Third year, which was 2020, we had 90. And now we have over 100. <laughs> so okay. uh, this is a lot of learning that happens in between. But, uh, but our mission is not the week itself. It's yeah. actually the other 51 weeks. So our mission is to support and sustain Black-owned businesses in the food and restaurant, food and hospitality space uh, through professional education mm-hmm. and, uh, and, uh, and, and really and, and education and professional development uh, by serving as a conduit uh, and as well as building a food ecosystem for our region. Yeah, because what you said earlier is so profound. Just, just because you had a recipe or a dish that you were just really good at and everybody loved this thing that you made, does not hand you all the other skill sets to run a, an effective restaurant and, and be profitable and, you know, be, be sustainable over a long period of time. Yeah, being, being a good cook is, is di- it's just, it's different from oh. being a good business owner. Um, Huge. So, so helping them get, accumulate those skills or hire those skills or, you know, have consultants or experts to help implement those other things is, uh, is just probably a great lifeline to those businesses. Absolutely. And there's so many paths to it, right? There's some that went to, culinary school. There's some that uh, started and finished, some that didn't go at all, some that didn't even come from the industry um, that have done that, that are there in the space. And so there's a variety of different paths, but at the end of the day, if you don't understand, have a relationship with your community. Uh, so economic development, who's your city council, uh, you know, talking to other owners, do you, are you working together? Yeah. So the power of collaboration is our ethos with our model being culture, education, good food. Yeah, getting those owners in the same room together is is very powerful. I get so busy with my business that I don't have time to go meet the other. But if I if I happen to be at an event and then so and so is in there, so and so is it's like, yes, you're who I needed to talk to. But I just would have never made. I, I would it, it wouldn't have entered my schedule or calendar otherwise. But thank goodness somebody disrupted us and got us in the same place at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, and it's taken five years now for people to really see. It's taken a very long time uh, for people to really understand what we do, but we just keep doing it. And yeah. uh, and and now it's uh, that this ecosystem is, is starting to take form. All right, this is good. Let, let's close out. What, what, is there what's your current research interest? Are you are you looking at any big problems at the moment? What what what, what are you what are you chewing on in terms of if if at all you might just be busy teaching? But what are you what are you currently working on? No, um, well, um, I mean. 
I'm in a position now where I'm uh, actually I have an administrative appointment as a faculty director, so I oversee the whole program, hire faculty, things such as that, as well as as well as teach. Um, and then I have the luxury, that's really the luxury to take what I'm doing um, and push it into the research space, um, as well as into uh, the, uh, the, the business of helping other, other businesses uh, within the space. So right now, I mean, we're really looking at uh, not just the week itself, but also how do we take this two things. One, how do we make this market, DC, a global destination yeah. for culinary? So I'm working on uh, some stakeholders with that. And I'm also working on uh, a platform to be able to, so in 20, from 2020 to 2022, uh, whenever anybody re, uh, watches this podcast, um, there was a huge influx of dollars that were allocated from corporations to black owned businesses. Now, what you have to understand is that we started in 2018. In 2018, nobody was sold on black restaurant week. Why do you need it? Why does this have to happen? We can't just give to black. We literally did this for two years and 2020, all of a sudden the floodgates open and it's oh, right. we're gonna uh -huh. take care of women businesses. Yeah. Go and we're just like, mm. so, um, but, but what we're seeing now is that, so when 2020 was hitting, we're, we were sitting here going like, well, what about 2024? What about 2034? Right. Um, and what we're seeing is that these dollars are coming down and they've been allocated really to the same four to five businesses. I'm being exaggerating, but it's the same group. Yeah. Why is that? And it's because there has to be a middle piece. There's, there's a gap in getting businesses up and ready. And so that when they receive these, these funds and these things, they know exactly what to, what, what to do and where to go. So they can go and compete for uh, the, you know, a supplier, be a, be a supplier uh, yeah. for, for, for companies or government contracts, or now it's time for me to open up a, a restaurant or maybe I go and buy a, a building. Um, or making myself, uh, you know, I want to receive these funds from the from a city or from a government so that I can go into this space. You have to, you have to be, you have to have your your your, your paperwork and your numbers and, and yeah. your, your steps set. And um, it's not going to happen from one person at a branch at a bank. Um, they've got the branch at the bank. People have got to or CD or CDFI. You got to have a grassroots organization that is out there with the businesses. And can really begin to pocket these and, and 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 you know funnel businesses into certain categories so that you're able to have more of an impact at, yeah. at, at with businesses at different stages. That's what I'm working on from that. All right. Well, I hope you're wildly successful. I hope thank I hope you, you so make much. a big I hope you make a big impact. Uh, that's it. This has been fascinating. Thank thank you so much for thank sharing you. your expertise. Uh, may, maybe we can do this again in six months so I can learn about the new things and the new developments and new projects and, and hear where you've, able, where you've been able to make a difference uh, moving forward. Thank All you right. so much. Dr. Oluwale, I, I really appreciate your time. Thank you.